Okay, we've reached the point of our, our last speaker today. Let me just introduce Chris Wheat, who is the Managing Director of Policy and Government Affairs at the Sustainable Cities Fund. The fund works with donors to support and enable equitable climate action at the local level. Chris serves as an adjunct professor in the Booth School of Business and is on the board of the Center for Neighborhood Technology. He's a native of Little Rock, Arkansas, and he holds a BA from Wash U in St. Louis and, and an MBA from Chicago Booth. Let's welcome Chris. Um, do like stretch. If you do, you want, if, if you if you are interested and able, if you want to stand up and and stretch, if you want to sit in your seat and just like you know, like you you've been we've been here for a minute. You're going to be here for a little while longer. Uh, so just 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 give me a second. See, that was pretty good, right? Yeah, feels better? Yeah. All right, all right, let's boogie. Um, so, hi, uh, good afternoon. I wanna thank the Christ Initiative for the invitation uh, and for the Mansueto Institute for the opportunity uh, to provide uh, thoughts and you know, appreciate the various disciplines that are being brought together uh, here because that's what, that's what policymaking ultimately looks like. It's, it's like a bad joke, right? Like a planner, and a lawyer and an economist uh, and a sociologist and architect like walk into a bar, right? But in the reality is that the, the, the sausage making of policy making and politics actually looks uh, that way and we'll actually talk more about some of the stakeholders who come to that discussion. Um, you know, when I asked Emily about what to talk about, she said, you can talk about whatever you want. And that concerned me uh, because I, I know less about climate policy uh, than most of the people in this room. And I, I definitely know less about housing policy than like anybody in this room. Um, so, but I'm hoping in, in my remarks, we can uh, talk a little bit uh, about some of the politics that are happening and maybe also some of the place-based solutions. Uh, Cause I think we've seen them here and there, but I actually think there's a lot of great stuff happening across the country and across the world. And I think at least for, for me as someone who works around climate and policy on a daily basis actually gives me uh, quite a bit of, of hope. So we're gonna start uh, with an exercise I do with my students. As, uh, as Emily indicated, I, I teach a class on, on climate economics uh, and, and politics at, uh, across the midway at Booth. And in the second week, I always ask them the, sa the, same the same question. I ask them, what are the different ways I can get from uh, the Harper Center, which is uh, the building of Chicago Booth across the midway, to the Gleacher Center. That's Booth's other building, is the business school. Of course, we have two buildings, uh, but the Gleacher Center is located downtown uh, over uh, by the river, right off of Michigan Avenue. So let me ask that question to y'all. So what, what, what are the different ways I can use to get from the Harper Center to the Gleacher Center? Okay, green, green line, I heard green line. Okay, what, what is, for those, for those not in Chicago, what is the green line? Okay, so that you can get, get, pick up the train at 63rd, you can uh, take that into downtown, you might take a bus or, or, or walk or something and get there. Yes, ma'am. You can take a helicopter. Wow, you really, you're, you are from the business school, huh? All right, all right, we're talking about helicopters, right? Okay, so you can, you, can, you can take a helipad if you want. What are some other ways you could do it? You can take a university shuttle, right? There's a shuttle uh, very conveniently now that takes you, you know, basically from one building to the next. Okay, we're on a roll. What are the other options that we have? Uh, Lakefront Trail, right? You can, you can bike or you can walk or you can scoot your way uh, all the way um, from you know, 57th Street or so uh, to, to Oak Street Beach and, and, and walk over. What? Metro Electric, Metro Electric right? Uh, so then that's how most Booth students take it. They're, you know, they're hoity-toity students that live in sky rises and uh, in skyscrapers in downtown Chicago. So they take the Metra uh, pretty much every day, uh, you know, from Hyde Park to downtown uh, and, and back. Car, and yeah, there's a, there's a car, right? There's a car. And, 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 and there are a lot of variances to a car, right? It could be your private vehicle. 
you could carpool. Uh, there used to, for those of you who are, who are younger than me, there were these yellow things called taxi cabs at one point in life that would take you places and you put your hand up and they would come to you uh, or you have you know, ride share or all these other options, right? Okay, so, so you got a bunch of different ways to do it, right? And if you are a student, if you're a staff member here, if you're a faculty member, you make this decision every day. And that decision may look different for a million different reasons, right? But you do this over and over and over again. And this is somewhat emblematic of what happens in climate change, right? So one of the frameworks I tell students early is that a way to think about greenhouse gas emissions or that greenhouse gas emissions are comprised of trillions of decisions made by billions of people every day, right? Every day a faculty member, I used to be a, a staff member here at the University of Chicago. Every day I would make a decision in terms of how I would get, get there or how I would go and pick up, uh, pick up my kids. Uh, every day people are making decisions about where they live. They're making decisions about how they travel. They're making decisions about how they are going to heat or cool or power their homes. They're making decisions about what they eat. Uh, or they're making decisions about how uh, the buildings that they, uh, that they work in, uh, how those are going to, to be powered, right? So uh, part of the reason that, it, that climate feels hard is because we're making all these decisions, right? And, 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 and what we're trying to do, and a lot of what we're talking about today is changing billions uh, of those decisions. And, and, and often I think as an individual it can get tough, right? Because you're like, I gotta do X, Y, and Z, and that's the only way that like, the world's gonna get better. But it's also important to recognize that these decisions are based on a solution set, right? And you may not necessarily have uh, full control in terms of what that solution set looks like, right? That solution set could be um, determined by your income. That solution set could be determined, as Danielle talked about, about your age. Uh, it could be determined by your mobility, your preferences, how much time you have, what your family situation uh, is. And then that gets magnified, right? You are making a decision as an individual, and then you're making that decision every day over several years. Then a city is making a policy decision in terms of what is the type of housing that we are going to provide. Are we going to allow for things like bike share? And what are the implications associated with that? Countries are making decisions about, sub about subsidies, right? Are we gonna subsidize clean power? Are we gonna subsidize uh, fossil fuels? Are we going to expand things like train access like the like the Amtrak or are we going to uh, build more highways and so uh, I think it's important for us to think about and and I think it, it really goes into a lot of the context of what we talked about today uh, is that we are actually trying to change behavior in reality for many folks and but for often for a lot of people that we talk about they actually uh, don't have much of a solution set uh, to work with as well and so the nature of the solution set that we are putting in front of individuals or what we consider our policy options or policy choices becomes really pivotal. And until we see a shift in the nature of that solution set, then we are ultimately uh, stuck in, uh, we are stuck in the, in the status quo. Um, I'm gonna bounce around here. You know, one of the nice things about going last is that like half of y'all, I have the speakers, I've already talked about everything I was gonna talk about. So uh, hopefully this will be a short discussion. Um, so we have talked about what emissions look like in the United States. This is uh, more of a, of a time scale in terms of emissions from 1990 until uh, 2021. Uh, you see that little uh, blip there under transportation and electric power, that is, that's, that's COVID. And so if you just look at heating and cooling for buildings, it's basically flat. Uh, since 1990, right? The number actually hasn't shifted that much. And again, that is, that's, that's, you know, that's heating, that's, that's heating and, 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 so, and some cooling as well. This figure takes that electric number and then puts it into all the different sectors, right? So if you look at that across the board, uh, you are seeing a reduction in emissions and that reduction in emissions is coming from electricity. Electricity is cleaner two things are driving uh, that uh, reduction in electricity emissions. One is the increase in renewables, and secondly, it's the switch uh, from coal and oil uh, to gas, right? And those are two uh, heavily, uh, heavily installed elements in terms of what is changing things. Um, so, you know, and data talked about these. One of the things, one of the reasons that this is important is that the solutions are out there, right? Because the curve 
is really beginning uh, to bend, but the question really is a question of speed and velocity. That, I think that was one of the points made by Dan uh, during lunchtime in terms of what, how quickly that comes down. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly here uh, is transportation. We have talked a little bit about transportation, but transportation is real important, right? Uh, part of the reason it's real important is, uh, if this thing goes backwards, uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, so as you can see, transportation uh, is, uh, has the potential to soon become the largest emission source, even if accounting uh, for, uh, for electricity. Um, and so how people move becomes a critical uh, component of how people ultimately use carbon emissions, uh, if you will. Uh, I am very lucky to be on the board of the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Uh, and here is a map of Chicago in terms of how much money people spend on transportation, right? As it gets darker, they spend more money. And as you can guess, as it gets darker, you get farther away uh, from transit. Uh, and so a lot of the work we do not only thinks, thinks about the built environment, not only in terms of uh, building emissions and density, but we also think a lot about transit. And I can tell you that not all of those dark blue areas are affluent parts of the Chicago land region, right? And that many of them are actually not even too far uh, from uh, where we sit today. Uh, so these are uh, neighborhoods where uh, there's very little transit access, very little bus access, uh, and you're seeing a very large portion uh, of uh, individuals' revenues of household income ultimately going uh, to transit. So I do want to emphasize that transit very much matters. Uh, transportation emissions very much matter uh, in terms of how we think about these problems. Let's talk a little bit about place. Because, you know, the, especially when it comes to housing, it looks very different depending on where you are in the country. So this is a map of the most prevalent uh, way that people heat their homes in America. And this is 2019, so the data is, is a little dated. Uh, and what you see here is in the light blue, uh, it's natural gas. And what you see in the dark blue uh, is electricity. So I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, you know, in, in, in our house, we had, we had electric heat until we moved to like a very older home. And I still remember being like 10 years old and being like, I had to go down like under in the crawl space and like light the pilot light. And I wasn't really sure why I was being asked to do that. Uh, now that I have kids, I understand why, because uh, my parents very much didn't want to do that. Um, and so I think it also gets to some of the, the, the point that, that Marla was making earlier is often you have this mismatch, right? You have this mismatch between kind of policy goals, housing demand, and housing supply. And so when we talk about things like decarbonizing the grid, for instance, right? What you have to do is you gotta turn all those light blue states, you gotta turn dark blue, right? And uh, many, in many of these states, you have uh, very old and uh, very incumbent housing that's located there. And then in the top, um, in your top, right-hand corner in the Northeast, you have heating oil. And one of the other things that has driven emissions down significantly is a reduction in the use of heating oil, particularly in New York State and other parts of the Northeast as well, which has much higher emissions. Uh, that, is, that, is a, that is an ugly, uh, uh, an ugly situation versus, uh, even, uh, versus even natural gas. Let's also talk a little bit about the concept of energy burden. Um, because not only do you like have to buy a home, but you actually got to maintain it as well, and you got to keep the lights on. Uh, and one of the things that we see that even, and, uh, even in those uh, communities that have high uses of electricity, uh, you also have high levels of, of energy burden. And this is work that, um, that Elevate Energy uh, and others have been doing uh, for some time. But you know, now we're talking about the layering on, all right? So you've got, uh, I will say insurance, because I think it's obligated that every person up here talk about insurance. So you have high insurance costs, you have high transportation costs, because you may ultimately have a lack of uh, transit. And then uh, your electric bill, even if it's just an electric bill, you don't already have very little gas bill, uh, is pretty high as well. And so the reality that we put a lot of communities in and a lot of households is a death by a thousand cuts. Right? And so then you see bills go up, you see defaults, mortgages, and we continue 
uh, in the vicious cycle that often it can be tough to get out of. So, you know, I try to emphasize my class at Booth talking a lot about uh, politics because, you know, uh, they're, they're business school students. They just want to, like, build discounted cash flows uh, and, you know, and, and talk about strategery uh, and, and things of that nature. But we try to also talk a little bit, we try to talk a little bit about um, the concept of politics and whom is ultimately influencing whom. Now, you see in the, in the top, you see firms, right? And if you think about traditional business school education, like a management education, it focuses on the firm, right? So we teach students about microeconomics and the you know, price, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the optimal uh, price and quantity of a given good. We teach them about strategy to figure out where uh, that good sits within an industry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when we're talking about government action, when we're talking about government policy, yeah, the firms matter, right? But you got all these other folks that matter uh, in this discussion as well. Some of these folks we've talked about today, and some of them we haven't, right? So you've got lobbyists, uh, you've got lobbyists and trade groups, you have workers uh, and unions, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about Chicago. Uh, you've got advocates and, uh, and uh, NFPs, uh, you have like communities and what communities are, are, asking, are asking for and what, and what they want, how they see themselves in its work. I, I have this, just nerds. All right, we have nerds. That's like, that's most of you. All right, uh, and, 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 and that's okay, that's okay, that's awesome. All right, um, uh, you have, but you have like the academy, right? You have the academy articulating uh, often uh, what, the, what the perfect is in spite of the good, and there's a significant and tremendous value in terms of keeping accountability on policymakers and politicians uh, at the same time. You've got the media, you've got voters, you've got all these other entities, right? And one of the important things to recognize, I think, from a policy framework standpoint is you've got all these entities are trying to influence the state. Uh, and the state could be uh, city government, it can be a mayor, it can be a president, it can be the United Nations, county, whatever. Uh, and often the state is trying to influence them. Because as we've talked about, often you need these folks to move as well, uh, in concert or sometimes even ahead uh, of, of, uh, of government in order to actually uh, make change, uh, change happen. You know, and, and a lot of this, and it's important to recognize that politics in its essence is an exercise in coalition building. So what is the nature of the coalition that you are trying to put together uh, across these entities? And a lot of my work focuses in or around cities. Uh, and I like working with cities because cities can and feel uh, different depending on your politics. I, I, always, I call cities St. Louis. That cities are the St. Louis of politics. I went to school in St. Louis, and, my, and I met my wife there. My wife's from Chicago. And I always saw, and being from Little Rock, Arkansas, I saw St. Louis as like this big northern like metropolis, right? And she was from Chicago, and she's from Chicago, and, and like St. Louis is like this cute southern town, right? And I think that cities often fall into that realm as well. If you talk about national politics, right, cities are like where the action is. Like, like President Biden loves talking about, you know, like mayors picking up trash and filling potholes and stuff like that. But then I think if you go to communities here in, in, in Woodlawn or Chatham, in the South Shore, other pieces, city, city Hall can feel pretty far away. Right, and so I think cities are an interesting place to think about the nature of policy and politics uh, because often they are closer than you know what the national government is, but often uh, the politics can vary uh, can vary pretty pretty significantly. So Boston University does a study every year uh, on uh, they do it like a survey of mayors. This was their 2022 uh, study, and they asked mayors specifically about issues of affordability. And they asked them, like, what are the biggest economic challenges that your city is facing? Uh, and you can see housing costs are, are far and away the highest, right? They're significantly higher than inflation. Now, this is a 2022 study. Would that look different in 2023, I think, is, is, is a fair, fair concern. But it shows, you know, there is a magnitude there in terms of how much uh, they, they see the, the impact of housing. Um, and then the bottom uh, chart is what they think, uh, what is a mayor's perception in terms of what they can do something about, right? And so uh, what uh, mayors are saying is, you know what, people don't think I can do a lot about inflation, 
People don't think I can do a lot about gas, the uh, price of gas, but people do think I can do a lot about housing. Whether or not I actually can, right? They feel like, okay, this is a, an issue I have to own. Uh, and this is an issue that has political ramifications. You know, one of the things uh, that uh, politicians like to do is they like to stay politicians. Um, and we're now in this mismatch that we, we've, we've fancied about over uh, today. And I think uh, Jesse actually talked about uh, how, how states and cities are trying to keep up with markets, uh, right? We have a national financial market and we have hyper-local housing situations and housing policies, right? We have city, we often have city or regional based or even community based housing uh, or housing policies. And that mismatch makes policy making really, really difficult, right? It makes it really messy. And we see this in real time because traditionally uh, the way politics has shaken out is uh, it's been business versus like the environmentalists, right? Like that was like the natural cleavage and, and we've seen that that has actually begun to shift over time. Some of that's because you've seen corporates actually take a more a stronger stance or at least like somewhat articulating a stronger stance on issues of climate. Uh, but as we go down the policy route, things are getting uh, messier. So an example of that uh, is in New York. So local law uh, 97, uh, which reduces energy use in large buildings in New York, there was a lot of discussion and debate and early on some opposition from affordable housing uh, organizations that you know, ultimately does this count uh, as an unfunded mandate, as we, as we were talking about earlier, that often uh, you know, making affordable housing deals, making the math work, gets real difficult uh, to begin with. Uh, and now you're gonna require us in existing buildings to reduce uh, energy use. Uh, the top there is a tweet um, from uh, a local, um, from one of the local unions uh, who are opposed to um, the uh, building decarbonization ordinance which is currently uh, in front of uh, the Chicago uh, City Council. Uh, the bottom right is an article in the Atlantic uh, about Minneapolis and some of the issues that Minneapolis has uh, been dealing with in terms of single family zoning. And that is put uh, some of the traditional uh, uh, conservationists uh, opposed to uh, environmental justice and other climate organizations. Uh, Minneapolis was lauded, right, as this great experiment that we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of uh, single family zoning and now it's been heavily uh, tied up uh, in, into, the, into the courts. Uh, and so the assumption that environmentalists frankly have often made is that uh, low income communities or communities of color, they've kind of taken them as a granted uh, in these uh, political uh, discussions. And the reality is that uh, they're coming back and saying uh, not so fast, right? That there's a true question about what is the uh, impact associated, um, uh, associated uh, with, the, with these uh, dynamics. I'm not denying that you know, fossil fuel interests aren't a part of this as well. I think you see this a lot on the state level. This is a map of uh, states that have passed bans on gas bans. Uh, so something like the Chicago ordinance that, I know, uh, something that like the Chicago ordinance that's trying to uh, reduce or eliminate uh, uh, gas use in new, uh, in new construction. Uh, in the dark red states, you can't do that. Cities are preempted uh, away uh, from that type uh, of ordinance uh, as well. Uh, n let alone the NIMBY versus YIMBY issues we see in places like California when the state is actually trying to mandate affordable housing uh, on those issues. And so now, you know, the pol so now the politics are getting, uh, getting real murky, right? And so, uh, so and they're, they get really hard and uh, it also becomes like the reason we're afraid of near-term action, right? Because we just like, we can't get the politics right. We can't get folks to yes. And then we kind of hope, we hope for like geo, uh, geoengineering, right? Whatever that is, right? Or we hope uh, for, you know, fusion, um, you know, as fusion's coming, right? Um, or we think for all these solutions that they're you know, finally going to come down the pike and they're often, uh, you know, they're going to get us there, right? And it kind of feels like this article, right? Like man announces he will quit drinking uh, by 2050, right? And so we just punt on the question, right? And then like, and you know, I've, I've felt this way a couple times, right? Like finally, I, I will get there, right? If you just give me enough time, right? 
And as many of us have talked about, uh, either, uh, either if, you, you know, if your focus is on uh, the impacts of climate change as an existential crisis, if, the, if you think about the concept of affordability, uh, if you think about the concept of homelessness and near homelessness, that the problems can't wait, all right? So we gotta try a bunch of stuff, right? We do everything, everywhere, all at once. And it's one, this is one of the reasons I love cities, right? Because we go and try a bunch of stuff, and some of it will be bad. Like, some cities just pass bad policies. Because, like, it just, it just happens, right? Some days you have a bad day, right? But the sample size ultimately has to get bigger in order for us to figure out what good policy looks like which means that some cities will have good uh, ordinances that uh, reduce, uh, that, uh, reduce uh, gas use, and some cities will have bad ordinances that reduce uh, gas use. Some cities will take good approaches to things like siting and permitting of uh, renewable, renewable energy, and some cities will uh, make, you know, make it take two years in order for a commercial building to get solar panels on trees. Like, like it's not great, but that's also just like, that's policy making, right? We're, 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 we're always trying to figure this out uh, on the fly uh, as things ultimately go along. Um, so a couple things I'm uh, excited about. I'm not going to spend much time here because you've already seen this slide. Uh, thanks, Jesse, uh, for stealing my thunder. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing I want to acknowledge here in terms of energy codes um, is that the work of, of, uh, of, of data and, and others to push us past just what the energy code says and think that there are other things on the frontier. So you need uh, new systems to get to continue to push the code down, right? Because that stuff goes out into the ether. We think of new stuff, new technologies. Uh, it gets commercialized. We reduce the cost, and then that's the that's the carrot. And then we can start using the stick. Uh, and then, and the stick is ultimately how are we going to build uh, the environment uh, there today? And it kind of gets back to the point that Dan was making that the technology. Uh, you know, that much of the technology uh, already exists. This is like the happy part of the talk, okay? And so, like, another happy part of the talk is the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. Maybe you've heard of it, um, and, and I think there's a lot of kind of interesting things there. Scott, early this, Scott Bernstein, early this morning, uh, teed up, uh, you know, Justice 40, which is far uh, from uh, a, a perf perfect tool, but the Biden administration seems to be holding on uh, to that pretty stingily, and some other entities are taking uh, that work a, one, a few steps further. Um, you know, the things I see, uh, the things I put in red here uh, are pieces of the pie, uh, which ultimately housing can take advantage of. Right, so there's like a little bit of money for housing. Like a little bit of money goes to housing and urban development, right? Four billion dollars, right? Maybe not enough to get you up in the morning, right? But if you think about transportation infrastructure, okay, so we're gonna invest in uh, building transit near affordable housing. Uh, we're going to take every method possible to reduce air pollution and greenhouse gases, which includes the built environment. We're gonna do things like improve the energy supply Remember, energy supply, big use of how existing housing actually like uses carbon emissions, then things start to you know, look up and look better. One important thing that's part of the Inflation Reduction Act is that now cities and nonprofits can actually take advantage of tax credits uh, for building renewables. And that's something that has rarely, if ever, happened before. The, the capital stack of these projects is starting to get a little better. Uh, we're doing more around connecting uh, housing and transit. Now, the concept of like transit-oriented uh, development is not like anything new. I think what's really new are like the places that are talking about it, right? So uh, places like Fort Lauderdale, Florida, are now getting grants from the Department of, Treas uh, Department of Transportation in order to do this work. Uh, uh, an organization I'll talk about in a second, we've worked with the city of Cincinnati, uh, who are expanding their bus system, and now they're building transit-oriented development around, high, around some of their high-speed uh, bus systems. Uh, Lansing is talking about this. San Antonio is connecting transit and workforce development. Uh, so they made a significant investment in workforce development, and they're basically taking that chunk of the sales tax now, and they're building out uh, buses and sidewalks. Uh, so they're not only kind of building a workforce of the future, but they're actually making sure that the workforce of the future can get uh, to work uh, at, at, the, at the same time. You're seeing more and more uh, uh, organizations, you're seeing uh, more work around things like 
uh, building performance standards and energy uh, benchmarking. If you think that that's good, you should thank Dana because she's been uh, funding this for a very long time. Not only measuring how much our building, how much energy buildings are using, but then driving down that energy use on a year over uh, on a year over year basis. That's happening uh, here in Chicago and happening in a lot of other cities as well. And it's places like St. Louis that are actually at the frontier of this. This is not just like a New York, right? We all wait for like New York and San Francisco and like Berkeley, right? We all wait for them to go and move on it. But now you're seeing interesting policy work happen in other places as well. And a lot of that work is happening in Chicago. So Elevate Energy has been retrofitting multifamily buildings uh, for uh, decades. And they've been doing it alongside the Community Investment Corporation, uh, which, is, uh, which provides uh, low interest loans uh, to landlords, uh, thinking about things like affordable housing. The cheapest and most climate conscious unit of affordable housing is one that already exists. So if you make the investments in keeping that affordable and helping the landlord, who is a small, most of the time these are small business owners just trying to get by, then uh, you're making the best investment for the climate. You're also uh, spreading those dollars out. The city of Chicago does a lot of that work as well. I also want to shout out the Johnson, uh, Mayor Brandon Johnson's administration, who's trying to move away from this concept of uh, aldermanic prerogatives uh, as it uh, comes to things like doling out uh, doling out tax increment financing dollars and actually putting it uh, in places where it ultimately is needed. Um, oh, and so I work at a thing called the Sustainable Cities Fund. We are what's called a programmatic regrantor. Uh, so uh, we work kind of like a foundation, except instead of giving out the money from like one old or dead rich white man, we give out money from multiple old, dead, or rich white men. Uh, and so we fund, uh, we support city work to make sure that they can access uh, things associated with the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we also uh, help uh, build something called America is All In, uh, which is a broader communications effort to bring cities, states, uh, businesses, hospitals uh, to the forefront of climate action. Uh, we say that that's, that's New Testament work. We're, they are, they're there to tell the good news uh, of climate action. They're not, you know, raining, raining petulance or taking firstborn children. Uh, and we are part of a, a new program called Bloomberg American Sustainable Cities, uh, which is uh, focused on uh, the connection between uh, climate and racial wealth equity in 25 cities around the United States. We also do advocacy and lobbying support through something called a 501c4 uh, because we do think that there are a lot of interests uh, at, at bay here and uh, we want to bring more dollars and fight uh, to that effort. Last thing I want to talk about uh, is I, I want to talk about Chatham. I want to talk about a woman uh, by the name of Dorothy Johnson uh, who I met uh, 12 years ago when I started working at the city. Um, Chatham is about two or three miles uh, due south of here. Uh, and this is a picture of when we went to go, uh, when she was getting her home um, air sealed, air sealed and insulated. Um, and you know, when we talked to her about why she was doing it, she wasn't doing it for emissions, uh, emissions, and she wasn't really doing it for cost. She was doing it because she wanted her home warm enough so her grandkids could play inside her house in the winter, right? That was it. Right, important, important work. We saved her money, reduced her emissions, but that was not ultimately uh, her, her focus. And I think that that piece is important because the volume of what has to get done, like we like taken in mass everything we've talked about today, it's a lot of stuff, right? And a big question is like, how do we meet people where they are, right? So this program met Miss Dorothy where she was. Uh, and I think it is important as we think about homeowners, as we think about financiers, as we think about that kind of the nerds, as we think about the, the big circle uh, that ultimately I put, put up is like, how do we think about meeting folks where they are? And I think that there's a lot of great stuff. I think y'all talked about a lot of those great things uh, happening around the country. And I think that that's important. You know, as, as I tell my students, like you, you, can't, you can't work in a world of fear. Like you, get, you gotta work in a world of hope, right? And I think that, and uh, you know, as I think about a lot of the projects and interesting things that y'all were working on. Uh, it gives me hope. A lot of the things that we talked about today uh, gives me hope. So I, you know, I walk away uh, more positive today uh, than when I win it that I think that we have the opportunity to tackle many of the issues uh, that are facing us today. Thank you very much.
Yes. Oh, sorry. 